When you think about human impact on the oceans, one of the things that gets talked about the most is our effect on coral reefs. So I wanted to find out more about this by coming to the only coral reef you can find in Boston here at the New England Aquarium. And I'm going to talk to Randy Rogen, a scientist who looks at coral, at what we do to coral, and how it can recover from that damage. Hi. Hi. We're here to see Randy Rogen. Oh, great. Let me give her a call. So coral reefs, I've seen them, I've been diving on them. They look really complicated. What are they? Uh, coral reefs are actually just made of corals, which are the animals, which are the foundation or the backbone of coral reefs. Ironic, of course, that the backbone of coral reefs is an invertebrate. But um, these really cool invertebrate animals have a symbiosis with an algae. Um, and that symbiosis is, is what's so colorful on reefs. And the symbiosis is what enables the creation of the hard skeletons, which are what is building all of the complex structure on reefs that you see. So the coral that makes a reef is actually a combination of a plant and an animal. That The coral is the animal, but there's another another piece that's necessary to actually have that color and have it survive? Yes, so these tiny little, they're called dinoflagellates, but they are tiny little plant-like algae that live inside the coral tissue and they photosynthesize just like plants do. Like if you see a piece of coral that someone has on their desk, that's the skeleton, that's not the animal. Right, exactly. You're looking at the skeleton that was produced by the animal in symbiosis with this plant-like creature. So a colleague of mine really likes to call them sea monsters because he says, oh, look, they're animal, vegetable, and mineral all rolled into one. And that sort of, I think, nicely demonstrates how complex these simple um, animals are. Coral is something that we can have a big effect on pretty easily and inadvertently, right? Just small changes in what humans are doing to the, the planet as a whole can wipe out a bunch of coral. It's true. Um, corals are pretty sensitive to a lot of um, the global impacts and actually the local human, impa uh, local human impacts as well. Um, in fact, coral reefs are suffering from um, what a lot of us like to say, it's death by a thousand cuts. So there are a lot of little things everywhere that are impacting corals, any one of which in isolation um, coral reefs may be able to handle. But since all of them are happening simultaneously, what we are seeing is a dramatic decline in corals worldwide um, due to a variety of different reasons and stressors, um, none, of, none of which we can really decouple because they're all happening at once. And when a coral gets sick or when a coral dies, that's when it turns white, right? When you, you hear of coral bleaching, but it's not bleach, it's just the fact that it turns white, right? I, I, I'm sure somewhere in the world somebody has dumped a bucket of bleach on a coral, <laughs> but when you hear about coral bleaching, that's not what people are talking about. People are talking about the symbiosis that I was mentioning before between a plant and an animal. Um, that's, that symbiosis breaks down, and um, the algae are providing the majority of the color for corals, and so when the algae are gone, um, what you are left with is clear coral tissue, basically, with a white, bright white skeleton underneath. And so a coral is still alive when it's bleached, but it just looks bright white. And so bleaching is the term that we, that we use for that. This is a coral that's not doing so well. So when people talk about disease or bleaching, corals turn white in both instances. This, to me, looks more like disease. But you can see that um, the recently dead areas are bright, bright, bright white. And the areas that have been dead for a little while already are sort of colonized with turf, turf algae. Corals are relatively simple animals. They can only show stress in a few ways, and one of which is losing their symbionts or losing their tissue, both of which lead to the exposure of the bright white skeleton underneath. So a lot of coral in the world is already gone, but I guess you've been to a place where it took a hard hit and had started to come back. Is there hope for coral? <laughs> I get asked this question a lot, and um, it's a really complicated answer. So the short answer is, I think, yes, um, although I will be very straight up and tell you that that's a controversial answer. Um, but so about 30% of the corals across the globe are, are already gone. We've already lost 30% um, of our tropical reefs. But I was just in a really amazing place called the Phoenix Islands, which are basically in the middle of nowhere. It is the largest marine reserve in the Pacific. The area itself is about the size of California. But um, in that ocean area, there are eight tiny islands. And um, there, and only in places like this, there are only a few reefs like this, the Line Islands notably, and um, the Phoenix Islands, where we can look at how coral reefs behave in the absence of local human impacts. People don't realize that the Pacific Ocean is so big that you can actually look at a view of the world where you see almost no recognizable continents. And that's sort of the view that you're getting right now as the world is spinning. And the Phoenix Islands is right in the middle of that, it's right there. So I guess like seven or eight years ago, there was a big change in temperature in the ocean there, and it killed off or at least bleached a lot of the coral. Yep, in 2002, 2003, there was an extremely major bleaching event. So 
really catastrophic. There was a massive die-off of corals in the Phoenix Islands. We've seen these kinds of die-offs in more nearshore reefs or coastal reefs. But in the Phoenix Islands, uh, what was so remarkable is, I mean, that really, it sounds like a long time ago, seven or eight years, but actually that's not a very long time when you consider the fact that it takes most corals, you know, tens if not hundreds of years to grow to, to a large size. And so um, a die-off like this w w was, was really catastrophic. But um, what we saw in 2009 was one of the fastest recoveries I think ever documented, which was very exciting. So I guess there is some hope if we can cut down on all the bad things that we're doing cumulatively to a reef that's close to the shore. If the Phoenix Islands can come back, maybe that could come back. Exactly. So think of it this way. It would be much more depressing if the Phoenix Islands couldn't come back because it would mean that everything we're doing on a, on a local and global scale is, is catastrophic for corals. There would just be no hope. But the Phoenix Islands were able to recover. And to me, I think it's a really hopeful sign that if we um, remove a lot of the local stressors, which are impacting corals, um, near, more nearshore coral reefs, um, reefs do have a chance. We have a limited window of time where there are still enough remaining relatively healthy coral reefs that they can help to repopulate uh, nearby reefs which are suffering. And we have a limited window of opportunity, I think, um, to reverse all of the trends that we've started in terms of overfishing, pollution, disease, and allow these reefs to recover. I think it's very hopeful. Well, it sounds like really cool work and it's good to know that there's some hope for uh, these amazing animals. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>